Welcome to the Detroit Kearns Podcast. We talk all things real estate, business, and entrepreneurship. Today, I have a new friend, Austin Hankwitz, who is a famous TikToker. He educates people on personal finance. He's got hundreds of thousands of followers. How many followers you got, Austin? Um, across platforms, maybe like 800 or 900,000. 900,000. And you're 26 years old. You live in Nashville, Tennessee. Tell us about who you are, what you do, and what you're all about. Sure. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Austin Hankwitz. I uh, create personal finance and investing content on TikTok as well as you know, repost to Instagram and YouTube and all those fun little places. I got a degree in finance and economics from the University of Tennessee back in 2018. Moved to Nashville, Tennessee out of college to do mergers and acquisitions for a healthcare company. Worked there for about three years, did about two and a half billion in deal flow. Uh, and during the pandemic, like everyone else, I, I picked up my cell phone and started recording TikTok videos. At the time, I guess I didn't really have a idea as to what I wanted my TikTok account to look like or, or what you know I wanted to be as a content creator. So I ended up just sharing my perspective as a 20 something year old, uh, fresh out of college, um, you know, my perspective on building wealth and what was happening to that process while the pandemic was happening. And so at the time it was, Hey, the stock market's crashing. Here's what my portfolio is doing now. Here, the stocks I think are pretty interesting now that this is the new normal, um, follow along to, you know, keep up with my thoughts and my perspective. First video I, I posted a TikTok, I think got one and a half million views in about a week, which was insane. And right. I just kind of kept right. up the momentum from there. So being a young guy, being 26 years old, Austin, um, what gravitated you towards TikTok as, as the way to kind of get your message out there? So back in 2015, 2016, I started watching Graham Stephan, Dave Ramsey, these type of really cool YouTube personalities that were incredible at what they did, which was sharing their perspectives on personal finance and investing to the world. And I had always sort of wanted to be a YouTuber. I really wanted to create that long form YouTube content. I didn't know how to video edit. I didn't know how to do thumbnails. I just didn't have the equipment. It was really expensive. Like it was a high barrier to entry at the time, at least in 2018, 2019, right. it kind of was. So for TikTok, it was like, Hey, I have a, I have a cell phone at the time. It was an iPhone eight. You know, I saw it a home button and uh, I was like, I'm just going to pick up my phone and, and share my perspectives and, and see if it stuck. Um, and it did. It was really, really cool. And, and so TikTok was the platform of choice because of the ease and availability. I feel like TikTok is still that, uh, that platform that allows anyone to just share their perspective, pick up their phone and just start talking to the camera, post it online and see if people, if it resonates or not. That's great. So tell us about like where you grew up and kind of like how you got interested in personal finance. And I know you mentioned that you just jumped, dropped or not jumped out of college, but graduated college. And uh, what were you doing? I mean, what did you major in? Um, you know, and what, where did things start? Where did your interest kind of start? I guess my main interest in the stock market came from back in 2008, when the market crashed, my dad had retired two years before that. Well, because of the market crash, we had to move across the country from Tennessee to Colorado because uh, that's where my dad could find a job at the time. And it was really weird to me that like there was this outside force called the stock market that has caused my family to move across the country. It's like, why? Like I, I had no idea what it was. I don't know why it impacted us so much. Like I just didn't understand it. And so that would have been probably like seventh grade, sixth or seventh grade. And so that okay. kind of sparked my interest in just like learning more about what the stock market was, why money is so important to understand what all this really meant, right? And then in, uh, I think it was my junior year, sophomore, junior year, high school, Dave Ramsey came to my high school uh, and, and he had a whole like seminar talking about Roth IRAs and investing and the baby steps and things of that nature. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And that really got me excited about, you know, if I was smart and if I decided to be disciplined and very strategic at a young age with my money, I'd be able to retire wealthy and re retire with dignity. And so that's sort of sparked my interest in finance and economics, which is what I majored in in college. Um, so, you know, got this degree in finance and economics and uh, it's just been a, a snowball effect from there. It's just kind of, you know, sparked the conversation and the thought process back in 2008 when everyone was talking about the stock market. Then Dave Ramsey kind of catalyzed that in a more intimate manner by actually coming to my high school. So I don't know if you knew this or not, but um, the state of Tennessee is the number one state in the nation for bankruptcy. And Dave Ramsey grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and is headquartered in Tennessee. So if this financial guru, Dave Ramsey, it lives here in Tennessee and his state is the number one state of bankruptcy, like that's that doesn't that doesn't work, right? That's that's not good. So he actually made a whole campaign to spend a lot of time 
going from high school to high school and teaching this new curriculum of the baby steps and better understanding how to make that budget, how to begin thinking toward your future from a financial perspective, which I was one of the folks that got to uh, experience that and it really resonated with me. So Austin, I got a couple of follow-up questions to that. So you mentioned that the stock market caused your family to move from Nashville to Colorado. What caused that? I obviously was... 10, 11 years old at the time. So I don't really know all the details, but I'd imagine my dad had too much exposure to the stock market. And when it went down, what was it? 40%. I think the S&P 500 went down from peak to trough uh, in 2008. It just caused, I'm sure you guys know like the 4% rule with like how you can retire on on 4%. You just take 4% off the the top every year and it just, it works. Um, But I think that was a little rough. For for people who don't know what the 4% rule, can you explain that to everybody? Who's listening sure. right now? So generally speaking, a really isn't how I plan to retire. A very straightforward way of retiring is you build up a nest egg. Let's call it a million dollars to keep things very simple. Um, you build up this nest egg of a million dollars. You keep it 100% invested in the stock market. And as we all know, over a long period of time, I mean, you go look at the last 90, 95 years of the S&P 500, you see it's performed about eight, eight and a half percent on an annualized basis. And so if you're able to take half that or 4% off the top, then you still have a 4% gain, quote unquote, over a long period of time that will continue kind of snowballing into a a larger sum of money uh, throughout retirement. And so with that being said, if you're taking this 4% off or 4% of a million dollars is this 40,000, every single year, you can live off $40,000 without really having to worry about running out of money because you're only taking off 4% of the total 8% hypothetical gain. So it leaves you still 40,000 in in annual gains over long periods of times. And so what makes that so powerful is years like this year when we're down 20% year to date or other years, I mean, you back up to 18 or 19, we were up uh, 19, even I think, I think one of these last like five years, we were up some 20 something percent. It's like, because the ups and the downs, if you stick to that 4%, it doesn't matter how high up we go, how low down we go. It's just a very easy, straightforward way to stay invested and stay living off of um, less than you make. Sweet. So Austin, when I started, it was around your same age, like 10 or 12. I actually um, started writing stock articles. I was a big Peter Lynch guy. I was a big Warren Buffett guy. I was, uh, you know, learned to earn and all that. And I actually started, you know, educating myself on the stock market and, and whatnot. And this was like, you know, between the ages of probably 10 till 16, I was very active. It was right when websites were coming out. I know that's a long time ago. I'm 44 now. Um, things have have really not changed much in the stock market. It's a it's a debt vehicle for companies that are trying to raise extra capital. What are the tips and tricks that you use? I'm assuming that you, most of your investment is in the stock market. Yeah, kind of. So I guess everything on my side is, I obviously have a lot invested in the stock market. Um, I obviously use different apps like Fundrise for real estate. I use Rally Road for collectibles. I use Coinbase for cryptocurrency. Um, I also have a venture capital firm. We've invested into 24 different startups over the last 24 months or so. Uh, We just actually became a scout for Bessemer. So we work really closely with them. Um, I advise Ensemble's venture capital firm out of uh, Austin, Texas. They were early investors in Zoom, Carta, and um, Grow, which is the Robin Hood of India. So do a lot of that. But yeah, I'd say generally speaking, a lot of my assets are in the stock market and in private companies. You are a smart fella. You're you're giving you're dropping knowledge on people right now. So for those of you who are listening right now, make sure that you go check out Austin on all his socials. Where they where can they find you before we get too deep into things? Yeah, I mean, if you want to just, I, I think generally speaking, a lot of my stuff could just be found on on our VC website, which is witz.vc. It's the last four of my last name, right? Wits. So wits.vc is our website. So let's talk more about venture capital, because as people may not know, that's what the entire stock market is built up, is which is raising equity, right, to mm-hmm. finance uh, private companies that then become public through the SEC. That's amazing. I didn't know that about you. And I'm, I really want to take a deep dive into there because, sure. in fact, we're in the process of starting our own fund. Uh, I own, you know, several hundred properties, and it's something that I'm not educated on completely. And I'd love for you to educate me and our audience about what starting a fund was like and what your goals are on that. When I mentioned before, when I started 
um, teaming up with somebody online on the stock market. We wrote articles. That guy actually own, is out of Michigan and he runs a huge fund out of Michigan, which is totally cool because we both started the same way. We're both in personal finance as well. And you're a young guy. I feel like I'm going backwards in my career, but you're you're way ahead of me than where, where I was at. So talk to us about venture capital and what you're doing with, the, with your VC fund. Yeah. So I think we take a step back to the first check I wrote, right? So I started making these videos in March of 2020 on TikTok and obviously had a really interesting experience building an audience and connecting with these people through, if it was my email newsletter, if it was through a Discord group or a Patreon community, but I had a really, and still do have a really intimate connection with my audience. It's one thing to kind of be a content creator and make money from the platform like you can on YouTube, right? With the the shared AdSense and things of that nature. As you might know, TikTok doesn't really do that. They have like the creator fund. Right. And with that, it's like three cents CPMs. And so it's, it's nothing to live off of. So as a creator, we're sort of forced to work with brands in a more sponsored post perspective that encourages us to one, um, introduce this brand to our audience and two, um, share with our audience why we like this brand or why we don't, you know, obviously just like why we do and why we want to recommend them. And so I quickly realized as a content creator, I have all these people who are sort of customers of myself, which is they, they are on my Patreon, they're on my Discord, they're whatever. Um, but as a creator, we don't really have our own exit. Like I, I can't sell my creator business to Shopify. I can't sell my creator business to Gary Vee. Like I, there's no exit opportunity for us. We don't have an IPO. Uh, we don't have anything. It's like what that looks like then that I quickly realized is, well, if I can't have an exit, the companies I talk about surely can have an exit. Why don't I make sure that our incentives are aligned in the sense that I have skin in the game with the companies that we're talking about? So a really good example of this, like how this really came to fruition was, I'm not sure if you've heard the robo-advisor Betterment, but I've been a customer of Betterment since 2015. You know, They're my Roth IRA, they're all that fun stuff for me. And so what I did is I made a video sharing like, hey guys, here's my Roth IRA and Betterment. Here's what's going to happen if I continue to uh, invest with my Roth IRA over the next 40 years. Like this is how much money hypothetically I might have. You should go try it out too. It's, it was not a sponsored post. It was simply me sharing my experience and being as transparent as possible with everything. And the video got some 24 million views across TikTok, what? Twitter, Instagram. What? Like, yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> what's interesting about that was it drove um, 40,000 funded accounts for Betterment which, and that's 40,000 new customers that they didn't have to pay for that I just drove for my one video, which saved them $6 million in ad spend. Again, they didn't pay me for this video. And uh, I quickly realized I saved this company $6 million by making a video about them because I was a customer. It's like, what happens now when I am a customer and I own equity in the company, right? It's like, why, do, why didn't I have equity in Betterment before making this video? And so then, then I guess what, what the next step for this whole like VC was, is like, what companies do I work with or what companies do I use? What companies am I a customer of that I can introduce the fact that I'm a content creator and that I've had these you know, case studies, if it was Betterment, if it was public, if, if it was Fundrise, these case studies to show like I drive funded accounts. I can, I can introduce your, co- your, your, your company to my audience in a way that's meaningful that provides them value because they didn't know you existed. Plus maybe there's like a, a perk or something that I can bring them. And that's useful for you guys, obviously, because your cost, your CAC now is so much lower than it would be off Facebook ads or YouTube ads. And so um, once we began doing that, we realized, okay, we only want to begin working with companies that want to bet on us in the long term. And so Fundrise, for example, we've been working with them for about two years. Public.com has been about two years as well. And these companies were like, hey, if we're going to work together in the long term, let's make sure our incentives are aligned. Like, I want to write a check for your most recent round, right? So public, I think, raised $220 million at a $1.2 billion valuation with the Series D. So we were able to get in on that. Um, similar uh, circumstance with Fundrise. And then after, I guess, these companies, it kind of shifted from I'm writing checks to companies that I work with in the sense that you know I'm an affiliate for or I, you know, I, just, I just work really intimately with them to being inbound approached by different people who are building their companies or have already built a company who is now looking for product, I'm sorry, for their go-to-market strategy, specifically through content creators. And so um, a really good example of this was a company that actually just reached out to me that I'm a really big fan of so far. And this is Fruitful. Uh, They just raised, I think it was $33 million over the last 18 months. They just came out of Stealth two weeks ago that had a nice big TechCrunch article written about them. And it's a really good idea in the sense that they are unlocking 
um, certified financial planners to their subscription membership services, right? So you pay $98 a month, you get unlimited access to a CFP, right? This is someone with a master's degree. They've got the CFP designation, whole ass thing. You compare that now to $250 an hour, traditionally speaking at a uh, family office or one of these types of you know, financial advisory firms or you know, $3,000 for an all-encompassing financial plan. It's so much cheaper and it doesn't gatekeep the whole ability to offer financial planning to people who are um, just in this, I just need some help kind of category. And so I guess going forward, these companies come to me, they say, hey, you're a rock star. We want to work with you. How do we do this? And I normally go back to them and say, hey, let's work together. Let's, let's just make sure like we're friends, right? Let me like use your product. I love this. Like make this all this cool. And then once right. I really double down and really, really believe in the product, I say, all right, this is great. Um, I don't know when you closed your last round. I don't know when you're raising again, but let me know either or, and I'm going to write you a check for 15, 20, 30, $40,000. So I now have skin in the game to make sure that not only am I sharing this with my audience, but I now have an incentive for you guys to do very, very well because I now own 50, 75, 100 BIPs in your company. And we've done so that strategy with, like I said, now 20, or 30, uh, 20 to 25 companies. Austin, you're dropping you're like wicked smart. You're probably one of the smartest guys that I've talked to. Like, and I'm not saying that to bash anybody I've talked to before. I'm just saying like, you are dropping so much vernacular on people. I'm going to, I've written down a couple of things just so that people can kind of understand what you're talking about, because you're very, you're talking at a very high level. And when, when people, when Austin talks about CPM or CFM, it's called two different things. What are you talking about so that our audience understands? So YouTube as a platform was built on ads. YouTube makes money by serving up ads or commercials to people that watch their videos. And YouTube splits the money they make. I think it's like a 60-40 split or 55-45, something like that. Um, I'm not monetized yet on YouTube, so I don't know the exact numbers. But YouTube then splits that money with the content creator that they served and add up on top of their video. And in the media world, ads are valued around per 1000 people that watch it. And so right. they throw a value of really any number you want on top of it. I know podcasting, for example, they, they try and stick around the 25 to 35 CPM range. So every thousand downloads your video gets, the advertiser pays you 25 to 30 bucks. Uh, YouTube can be as low as, I don't know, a couple dollars, as high as maybe 30 or 40 as well. Uh, yes. And unfortunately, TikTok is only, I think, three or four cents. And that's because they don't yet, I think they're going to very soon, but they don't yet split that ad revenue with you. They instead have a monthly creator fund that gets evenly split or proportionally split rather um, with all the creators that, that share to their platform. So Austin, a follow-up question on that is how are you finding out all of your information? You're very, you go, you take a lot of deep dives into stuff and, and you, and as you deep dive, you go deeper. Like you keep, I'm thinking you're going to stop and just give me a very basic surface answer. But so what does your research look like on your end? Because you've got a huge brain. I mean, not physically speaking. I don't know what it looks like, but I can tell it's working over. Hey, I'm, I'm six foot one. So I'm a little big now. Um, <laughs> but I would say, uh, I think it really just comes down to experience, man. I think at the end of the day, it's like Christian Blackwell, my co-founder and I quit our jobs. I mean, we had very awesome jobs. He was doing uh, pricing and profitability consulting for PwC in New York. You know, I was doing M&A for this publicly traded healthcare company. Like we were very sharp fellas. Um, but we quit our jobs a year ago, which was a year into building this business. And now about two years, two and a half years into building this. And it should come down to experience. It really just comes down to having those conversations with people that are smarter than you. It comes down to, it's actually really funny. Um, one of my favorite things to do is when someone asks me a question, that's like very easy to just like Google, I just send them google.com. It's like, there's so much on, on the internet to learn by people right. who've gone through it, by people who are sharing their experiences. I think building in public is very, very prominent now. I think transparency is very prominent now. There's a lot of people right. who are willing to answer your questions, who are willing to share their experiences, including myself. And so that's like one side, but I guess on the other side, it's like, I also have my um, sub stack. It's like this newsletter. And so I, I, I deep dive into rate of return and the tagline is um, giving you the tools and resources to attack the investing week ahead. Um, let me read the about. It's actually kind of cool. Rate of Return is a publication where anyone can find curated financial news, analysis, and commentary to attack the investing day ahead of you. And so 
as that, I mean, we just did a really deep dive into um, obviously recession talks. I think it was two weeks ago, we published 15 reasons why we believe we're going into a very bad recession. Um, and I think just yesterday, the Federal Reserve in Atlanta gave out their uh, expectations that the GDP for Q2 is not 0.3 positive, but actually 1.0% negative. Um, so pretty much in a recession now, it's kind of, you know, we, we've known this, but I think it was on Monday or Tuesday, I did a deep dive into what that might look like. But I think it's really funny that people get intimidated by information and they think that Wall Street has this edge of information and, and sure, they have a, a lot of access to information, but there's a lot of different places you can look toward and look to that can help you better understand what's going on and what people think are going on around us. And one of my favorite places to do that is earnings call transcripts. Every single publicly traded company, every single three months has their earnings call and every single one of them sits down in front of a phone or some sort of microphone and read off a transcript and take Q&A from the audience. And it takes someone, call it 30, 45 minutes to read all of that, but there's so many nuggets of information inside of that that people can find that not only impact the company specifically, but from the perspective of macroeconomics. So you mentioned before you had a job doing M&A, which is mergers and acquisitions for people who don't know what that means. That's a pretty high level job for somebody who just graduated college. I mean, most guys I know who are doing mergers and acquisitions are very long in their career. So how did you get that job as, a, as somebody who jumped right out of college? I mean, how'd you land that? Yeah, dude, I get really fucking lucky. <laughs> I got really lucky. Um, That's good. So, I'm glad. Yeah, no, for, I mean, I'm not gonna lie about it. I got really lucky. So I guess the only thing that I could lean into that before was um, I got an internship at um, LBMC, which was in Knoxville, Tennessee. My junior year of college, LBMC is an acronym that stands for a bunch of old guys' last names. I forget. I think it's like Lattimore, Black, uh, something, I don't, Cooper, I don't know. Anyway, but LBMC is the name and it's the, uh, the largest business development firm in the state of Tennessee. And about 40% of their business comes from physician services. And so that was the department that I was working in over that, uh, that summer. And um, I just really got into healthcare. I just really enjoyed learning more about healthcare. And I ended up applying for this job at Emeticis where they happen to be the nation's largest home health hospice and personal care company. And as right. you guys know, might know, um, home health hospice and personal care are for very old people. Our average customer's age was about 79 years old. Um, they lived anywhere across the country. And as you guys know, there's probably, or as you guys probably know, there's a lot of baby boomers, right? A lot of people turn uh, 65 every single year, every single day, every single month, right? A lot of people. So we have this massive growing market that we call the silver wave that was really starting to pick up steam in 2018 and that we thought was going to begin to kind of peak in 2024, 2025 and really start to kind of come down in 28, 29. And so generally speaking with why m I think was so important for Emeticis was despite being the nation's largest um, of those three categories. And when I say that, I mean, we were doing two and a half billion in revenue a year and we had some 400, 500 uh, facilities across the United States, employed tens of thousands of people. And despite all that, we only had a 4% market share, 4%. So it's a very wow. fragmented industry. A lot of mom and pop shops, a lot of, sure. you know, yeah, yeah, a lot of, a lot of mom and dads that are kind of pulling together these, maybe they've got, they're, they're probably doing about 1.5 or 2 million a year in revenue. They've got three or four locations across their town. And some of them have, you know, maybe a dozen or so, but like, that's, that's the extent of it. And so with that being said, you can't just like, it, it, it was much more advantageous for us to just start buying and bolting on these types of acquisitions, just tuck them all in, right? You, you know, you've got a, you know, seven over here in this city. We like the margins. We think we can expand them with our technology. Boom. You're, you know, we're going to buy you for $14 million, tuck you in. We're going to buy you for $20 million, tuck you in. I think the largest we did was we had a $340 million deal with a hospice agency. Um, just buy them, tuck them in. And that's, that was how we expanded and it worked. Cool. Great answer. So a couple of questions. Funny. My sister actually works for one of those small companies and I'm, I'm very familiar with them because my grandma was in one and you, you see a lot of immigrants who come and start those businesses because, you know, they make between four to eight thousand, ten thousand dollars per patient and they can make a lot of money taking care of people who need the help. So you're 100 percent right. It's a fragmented industry, very similar, actually, to the storage industry in terms of how fragmented it is. My question for you is. You're dropping a lot of knowledge. What advice would you give to somebody? You know, TikTok is full of um, a lot of younger people. 
and I'm sure your audience is mainly younger people. And my audience is a lot of younger people, you know, under the age of 28, majority of people. What age would you give to young women and men, even teenagers, advice that has changed your life to, so that their trajectory can be coming to multimillionaire to be as successful as yourself, Austin? This is probably my favorite question to answer because it is so important and it is so transferable from person to person. My goal is to get as many people in the investor class as possible. My goal is to get as many people to not think of themselves as consumers, but to think of themselves as owners. Really good example. I made a video about this about two weeks ago, Kim Kardashian, everyone knows her, they love her, they might like her skims or whatever. Um, She just launched Skin, S-K-Y-N-N by Kim K, which is like her, you know, beauty products, whatever. And it's being launched alongside Cody, C-O-T-Y. It's a publicly traded cosmetics company. Now, all these people are going to go rush to her website to buy Kim Kardashian's skincare product for $90 a bottle but they ignore the fact that Cody is the company that's, that's partnered with her in launching this. And Cody's only $7 a share on the stock market. So instead of you know, spending $90 for this bottle, why don't you spend $90 in Cody stock and own a little piece of what Kim K is building herself? Or even do both, you know, buy your $90 bottle, but maybe toss in 10 bucks to Cody stock so you can actually own what you're consuming. And I think a lot of people, unfortunately, don't understand that so many products and services that we're consuming as people in the United States are publicly traded companies, right? Where do you shop at? Walmart, Target, Dollar General, all in the stock market. When you shop, what do you swipe? A Visa, a MasterCard, or American Express, all in the stock market. Um, you know, what, what, what are we communicating of right now? Zoom, stock market, right? right. People totally. are consumers, unfortunately, and they need to think of themselves as owners. And my easiest advice to as many people is like, look at your bank statements, look at your credit card statements, look at just around you and, and think like, what are you buying? Is it Netflix? Is it Spotify? Is it Apple Music? If so, go buy their stock. Or where are you eating at? Is it Darden restaurants or like Outback, right? Where, like, where are you spending your time, energy and money and making sure that like, You are proportionally allocating funds to also own the companies that you're consuming. That's the end game, right? Own the companies we're consuming. So as these companies continue to do well from ourselves and other people that consume them, we see the upside in that. Yeah, Austin, that's a great answer. I I wrote actually an article when I was 16 years old called Investing in Things You Know, right? And it's exactly that thing. Like if you're going to McDonald's and you know that's a great company invest in it. So I think that's excellent 100%. advice. My other question for you would be, where do you see yourself in the next few years? I'm sure like, as we're talking here right now, you didn't see yourself where you're at right now making, I don't know what you're making, but you could tell our audience, our audience likes numbers. I'm sure you know that anytime you talk about numbers, they're going to like that. How much money are you making from being a creator through all these things that you set up? Yeah. So I actually was on the front page of Bloomberg last wow. September. It was an article that I, I did where Missy, uh, she's an incredible journalist, was asking different creators who used to work in finance that now work in financial TikTok full-time right. and made that jump, how much the, 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 the monetary change was. So when I was at Emeticist, I was making about 70K a year. And then last year, uh, our business made about 700,000. And this year, I think we'll do 1.1 or 1.2. Um, I guess we'll see. Good for you, bro. Good for you. Awesome Thanks, job. Man. Anybody who's listening right now, first of all, make sure you give this uh, podcast a five-star review. Make sure you follow Austin because obviously if you're, you're 26, you said? 26. He's talking at such a high level. I feel like I'm talking to somebody on CN- CNBC. You know, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're so freaking smart. It's so inspiring to even just to me as a 44-year-old guy who's done really well for myself just to li- to watch the access to information at your age from where I came from is such at a higher level that you're so freaking smart that people, sh- if you should listen, definitely subscribe to this, this podcast right now. Definitely share this video with someone that's going to help, but follow Austin's journey. Cause I guarantee you in five years, I don't even know what it's going to look like. You've already featured on Bloomberg. What did you, what would you like to do if everything went your way? I just really think that creators are just getting started in the sense that, and I'm talking about like actual creators, like I'm talking about people who like genuinely love to share their perspective on some sort of niche. If it is gardening, if it is mustard making, if it's wallet making, if it's personal finance and investing, if it's candle making, right? It's like, Whatever they loved, like every, everyone has this underlying passion that people will listen to. TikTok showed that, right? During the pandemic, I could, 
I can't tell you now how many people I follow that like make candles or make soap or share their perspective on recent developments in the news or or maybe their their traveling experiences that I just like love to keep up with and stay attached to. And so what I would love to do in three, four, five years from now is those people are all working nine to five jobs and they're doing this as a way to express themselves. And I think not just those people, but also tens and tens and probably hundreds of thousands of more people are also doing this as a way to express themselves. And there are tens of thousands, I don't want to say hundreds of thousands, but there'll be tens of thousands of companies who align very, very well with what those people are doing, sharing, and want to somehow reach the audiences that listen to those people. I don't care if it is the mustard bottle company trying to find a cool person who makes awesome mustard and the, their audience or whatever, but like there's a ton of synergies between the companies and the people who are making content that the companies want to leverage to get access to their audiences and in, in a very aligned and straightforward mission-driven type of way. And so as we've sort of begun to do with VC on our side is, is begin to connect these creators with the companies that can really um, take them to the next level that they kind of like a go-to-market strategy, right? It's like, we have this company who is really looking to sell a product or really looking to sell a service or are really looking to introduce themselves to millions of people. There are tens of thousands of creators that would love to have that opportunity to be the person to introduce that company to their audience. And if there's a world where we can connect them, make sure that those companies have the aligned incentives, if it's with equity, if it's with a earn out bonus, if it's like what, whatever, but to connect them in a way that the company can generate sales, the creator can now make more money than they were from their nine to five job and have their first you know, equity in a cool company. It's a win, win, win situation. And obviously the audience now has a cool product that they didn't have before. Um, so yeah, I just, I just really enjoy like thinking about where the creator economy is going and, and, and connecting creators that are very, very good at what they do with companies that I believe could absolutely take them to the next level, as well as make sure that these creators are not taken advantage of. I'm not saying I was, but I think like back in 2020, every creator was selling themselves short, considering just how big things have gone now and how dependent companies are on creators, successful, strong um, willing creators and to just make sure that everyone's incentives are aligned to make sure everyone's having a good time. And I just, I don't know, it just gets me excited. That's great. That's great. I got three quick questions because we're, we're running late and you've got so much knowledge. I want to make sure, and I know that's my sure. fault that we're running late. First question, what book changed your life? I know you're a, a avid probably reader just based on things that you're telling me. Is there a book that you would recommend that to our audience or books that you would recommend that have really changed your life? It's a good question. Um, I know this is kind of embarrassing, but I don't read a whole lot. But the last book that I did read that I think was really powerful was it's called Git Community. And what it does is it walks through uh, of that nature. But generally speaking, what it does is it walks through several case studies of different people who built communities um, around their passion. And like Jenny Craig, right? We all know Jenny Craig. It's the lose weight. You know, that's a case study in here. And it's like how she was able to build a community of strong-minded women to all lose weight together. And it's just like, it's really interesting from the perspective of a content creator who's also trying to build community with people that are not just other creators and like-minded creators, but also my audience. And so I think that book was, was really powerful. And shout out to John Hu, the CEO of Stan, for uh, sending it to me. Great. Um, another quick question. How do you deal with haters? I know on TikTok, I get a ton of hate. Welcome. I'm sure... Block them. That's what I, dude, I abuse the block button. I do. I abuse it. I don't give a fuck anymore. If you, if yeah, you comment. Them and fuck them, I love that. Report them and fucking block them. If they're nasty, nasty yeah. right back. Love that. Answer. Yeah, no, I don't. I, in the sometimes though, like what I enjoy doing is, as you know, like I'm very like, I'm well-researched. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not just going to post some bullshit. And so if I post something on TikTok and someone is like, no, this isn't true or no, no, no. It's like, I will, and, and I will quickly hit him back with the facts and let him be like, this is the case. This is why you're wrong. And here's this. And then they can, if they obviously keep going, it's like, all right, you're blocked. I don't care. But even sometimes like right off the rip, if they just like comment some bullshit, I'm just like, no problem. You're blocked. And it's, it's on to the next one. People are so nasty at, and, and Austin's really not taking a deep dive on this one, but I mean, they will just crucify every imperfection in yeah. you that they can find any sort of weakness. And it's just, 
after a while, at first you kind of get sucked in. At least I did a little bit. Oh, I did too. Yeah, no, it sucked in the first like six months. I was like, man, what am I doing wrong? Like people really are upset or like, this is wrong. Or this is like, and then after a while I realized like there are 99 people that comment good stuff that appreciate what I'm sharing to the one person who is commenting bullshit. It's like, those are the people I should focus on. Those are the people that I should cultivate relationships with, not these haters. And your haters are never going to buy your products. Your haters are never going to do anything. All they're going to do is validate that you're actually doing something right. The more hay you get, the more you know you're doing something right. Uh, quick follow-up question. Crypto. What are your thoughts about crypto? Um, I got really lucky. I bought tens of thousands of Chainlink back in 2018, around like 45, between 45 and 60 cents um, when I was in college. And um it 100x, which was cool. And I just got super lucky in, in cryptocurrency. But I think there's a lot of shams. There's a lot of scams, a lot of bullshit, obviously, like everyone else is saying. Right. Um, right. But I think that it just comes down to like truly understanding what you're investing into, kind of back what we were talking about before. And I truly understand the value add that Chainlink brings to the you know, blockchain agnostic. What they do, generally speaking, is we all know what smart contracts are. If it's with an Ethereum smart contract or if it's with a Cardano or whatever smart contract, smart contracts are like vending machines. You put in a dollar, you click the Pepsi and the Pepsi comes out, right? If this, then that. However, the if this part, if that data that gets put into the smart contract is wrong, then it doesn't matter how smart the smart contract is. The data going in is wrong. The smart contract's not going to work, right? So smart contracts, in my opinion, are the most revolutionary thing to really come from the blockchain technology that we've developed or even discovered. I don't know. Um, however you want to, I guess, categorize that developed, invented, let's go discovered. Back, let's go back a little bit because even sure. myself, I've, I've talked to a lot of people about crypto and you seem to be very educated about it. You know, I think it's more of a sham. I think that until the central bank gets their claws in it, it's never going to go, go anywhere, really. I mean, there's going to be people who boom and bust and stuff like that. And there's going to be people who, who 100x, 1000x their money and for picking the right thing. But it is a gamble, as you know. Can you talk about what blockchain is and what was that last thing you just talked about? Yeah. So here's sort of how I think about it. And this is super high level, easy to understand terms, right? I think of Bitcoin as the computer. Bitcoin brought to us this cool idea that we can now use a computer. We have this like programmable stuff. It's really interesting. We have this cool technology, right? Ethereum is the programs inside the computer. It's Microsoft Excel, it's Microsoft PowerPoint, it's right. it's the actual applications, the decentralized applications we have, the dApps on our computer. And that is, you know, as we know, Ethereum could be um, programmed to do really cool things. And, and if that's through a smart contract, like I was just talking about, or you know, just whatever else, but Ethereum is really unlocking the full potential of your computer, right? Which is Bitcoin and the blockchain, right? That's this kind of machine. And now what Chainlink does and, and how I think of Chainlink in this whole grand scheme of things and why I have so much money invested into it and have for a long time now is how useful is that computer? How useful is Microsoft Excel, those applications on the computer without access to the internet, without access to true real world in real life data? That's what Chainlink does, right? So Chainlink brings in the real world life data. If it is, I don't know, price um, action on a, on a on a price feed, if it is the weather for your crop insurance, if it is the election results for uh, Joe Biden versus Trump, like whatever that real world data is, Chainlink brings it onto the blockchain into your Microsoft Excel, into your PowerPoint, allowing you to really build robust applications on the blockchain through smart contracts. And so I guess what I'm saying is with a smart contract back to sort of the vending machine example, with the vending machine, vending machine and smart contracts are very similar. You put in a dollar. So here's what, here's what I'm putting in. I click what I want, Pepsi, and it comes out. So you can program a smart contract that says, hey, on the fourth of every month, I want this bond coupon payment right, to pay me 80 bucks. And so the input is the calendar date. The output is the $80. But what if the calendar date was wrong? What if there's no real way on the blockchain, right, to really understand what day of the week it is. And so that's what Chainlink does. It makes sure it verifies that whatever goes into that smart contract, if it's a calendar date, if it's a weather, if it is um, shipping, like, like literally endless things. They have like some 1600 integrations. Whatever that data is that goes into the smart contract, Chainlink makes sure that that data is correct. So whatever comes out of it is going to happen with um, complete truth. 
that's that's my most uh that's, 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 that's great i appreciate that um a couple a couple more questions for you so are there any particular stocks that you're really bullish on right now? Um, you're obviously, and, and, and then if the follow-up question to that is going to be, what was your second choice of a career? And I know there are two random different questions besides personal finance, because you seem like you'd be like almost a computer science guy um, if you weren't in finance, in my opinion, what I'm picking up on. Yeah. So the first answer to the first question is just like cybersecurity in general, right? We saw with the uh, pipeline hack we've seen over the last two years, as more and more people move online, cybersecurity is going to be here and it's going to stay and we're going to need more and more of it. Um, Palo Alto Networks, ticker PANW has been around for 20 plus years, free cash flow machine, they're crushing it. Um, so really excited about what they're doing. Um, to your second question of like, what would I do? It's actually really funny. Um, I've always been an entrepreneur and I've, I've seen myself as an entrepreneur since I think I was like fourth grade when I got pulled to the principal's office for reselling um, stuffed animals I got out of the claw machine at the gas station. Like I've just nice. always been an entrepreneur. So I actually like that was like my end goal was to, to just be an entrepreneur and work for myself. And so I worked in M&A because it's like was the the least uh, grueling and, and like, just, it was just the most interesting thing to do for me at the time. But no, I don't think I'd have a second career. Like it was like being an entrepreneur was the first career. And like, I did this so I could save money and like have stability while I built this other side of being an entrepreneur, if that makes sense. Yeah. So does that boil down Austin to your why is like, it's, it's funny. Cause I think we have like a similar background in terms of like, I'm, my parents were broke. I don't know if your parents were broke, but my parents were broke as you know what growing up and that like, you know, I didn't know, they didn't tell me, you know, I didn't have a bad childhood. I had a great childhood, but we moved around. You mentioned you moved from uh, Nashville to Colorado or earlier in the conversation. And I, I was displaced. And I found out later at 44 years old, when I was interviewing my mom, that like, it was because her house got foreclosed on. Do you think your why is from your childhood? Something my dad always shared with me was, I think the movie was, is it pumping iron or something by Arnold Schwarzenegger? But I, I think my childhood, how, how that comes into this is my dad was always the type of person to say, like, stay hungry, like never be satisfied. And right. so I would say that part of my childhood, for sure, um, has, has leaned into who I am today. I think, you know, a lot of people are born into very specific circumstances that mold them into who they are when, they, when they're older, um, for good or for worse. And right. I, uh, I ended up on the good side of that. And so I guess, like, how I've spent and how I plan to spend the next 40 years of my life is making sure that no matter where you were born, um, good side, bad side, whatever, how do we get you to become an investor and be part of the investor class? Because that is the most tried and true way of building wealth over a long period of time. Cool. Austin, I've really enjoyed speaking with you. You're, you're, you're a smart young man. I think that your future is super bright, brighter than probably anybody I've talked to in a long time. I think it's like, <laughs> thank you. I, I mean, it just, it's really impressive. I mean, you're blowing my hair back and I don't even have any. So, um, you know, it's one of those things that when you talk to young people like yourself, it gives me hope because I see that this younger generation, good or bad, is a little bit lazy. You know, a lot of the guys, the social skills are lacking, right? Like they're on their phone versus talking to people. And so as I've got two eight and a half year olds, they would be by all arguments privileged. They growing up privileged because their dad has made it right. And so my whole, your dad's advice to, to you is to stay hungry. I'm trying to instill that into my children. So it's really, really nice to see someone who is as hungry as you for information and is, and is willing to share that information to all of these people. And that's obviously why you achieved this huge following. My, my last question is going to be for those of us who are listening to you right now, and we're just captivated by what you're saying, what is one piece of advice that you could give someone that would change their life if they're listening to this podcast right now? The one thing that changed my life, which was to completely drop the ego. I used to care so much about what people thought about me, if it was on social media, if it was in real life, if it was like, I just, and I, and I, and I hid from my, my real life. So it's kind of funny. I like, 
I have like um, a real life Instagram and I have like a, a, a TikTok Instagram. Like I had, you know, I had like this, this second real life that I didn't want to interweave between what I was doing with TikTok because my ego got in front of me. And I was like, I, it's embarrassing. People are going to make fun of me. Like, I don't want people to think I'm like, I don't give a fuck anymore, dude. Fuck everyone. It doesn't matter, dude. No one cares. No one doesn't want, no one wants to know. No one doesn't like it. Just do what makes you happy. That is the biggest advice I can give is do what makes you happy. If it's making funny videos on TikTok, if it is becoming a professional skateboarder, if it's making your own movie, if it is traveling the world and vlogging it on YouTube, like do whatever makes you happy and completely forget about the ego because in 10 years, 20 years, five years, no one's going to care. No one's going to want to ask. And like, you're going to look back and say, damn, I really wish I did that. Now I just realized that no one actually cared. I, I should have done that. And that's kind of what I guess I realized over the last two years. That's, that's excellent advice. Very tough advice. And one thing that also just mentioned there, and, and, you know, I heard this in an interview with Mike Tyson, he said, you know, everybody's insecure. Everybody has something. It doesn't matter if it's the president of the United States. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, uh, whoever, the most powerful por- person in the world is insecure about something. We all have insecurities. We're all human beings. And I think that dropping your ego, I mean, yeah, for me getting those hate and that really brings it out. You really get to learn through social media how people behave because they let it all out there. And I think that that is such great advice. If you can just ditch your ego. And a lot of times that that's called maturity, right? Like it, yeah. I didn't really yeah. mature until, until I was 28 years old and I'm still maturing right now. But yeah, we all care what other people think sometimes. And, you know, we have to, to a certain point in time, like be in touch with other people's feelings and emotions to be able to be mm-hmm. relatable and stuff like that. But I think that advice is so great. Um, I, I just want to stop right there and t- say, Thank you for your time. Thank you for spending all this time with us on this podcast. Thank you for sharing all of the knowledge that you've given us. I really, truly appreciate it. I'd like to invite you to come to Vegas on my actual live podcast. Compliments of me. I'll fly you out there the next time I'm there. I'll put you up in a hotel. And my last- yeah, Actually, final- we're going to be in Vegas um, for Money 2020, actually for a NASCAR race as well. I think it's the same weekend. You should, uh, yeah, you should go to that conference. Maybe we'll film a, a live podcast then. Cool. That sounds good. I'll, I'll get your number after the thing. Um, guys, thanks for tuning in. Give this a five-star review. Make sure you subscribe to Austin on all of his, you want to drop down your socials real quick again? Yeah, just at Austin Hankwitz, uh, A-U-S-T-I-N-H-A-N-K-W-I-T-Z on everything. On everything, on everything.com. Thanks, Austin. <laughs> I appreciate you taking your time and uh, we're wrapping up guys. Make sure you subscribe, make sure you get started, make sure you take action, ditch the ego, make content. You see what it's done for Austin. He's a young guy. He quit his job. He's going to make a ton of money this year. Pays made up $720,000, went from a $72,000 a year job, 10 X his job. His future is so bright. The freaking North star is burning up. And I'm, I'm excited to chat with them. And I really appreciate your time this morning. And I look forward to putting this podcast out and getting a lot of people inspired. Your answers were great. I totally appreciate everything you did. And Austin, I appreciate everything for you. Peace, guys. 